So good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Lauren Piner. I teach um, high school, specifically world history, as well as Holocaust and genocide studies at South Central High School in Pitt County, so on the eastern part of the state. I've been teaching for 11 years, and I am a member of the North Carolina Council on the Holocaust, as well as one of our regional directors for our program planning committee. We're so glad that you could join us tonight. Um, I'm going to ask my colleagues, Lee, Lindsay, and Kenzie, to introduce themselves very quickly. My name is Lee Holder. I'm a recently retired social studies teacher. I'm a fellow at the uh, museum, also a member of the North Carolina Council on the Holocaust, uh, one of the regional directors for the uh, education program programming committee. And also I have a resource center here in Eastern North Carolina. If anyone else lives in this area, I'll be glad to help you with resources and teaching the Holocaust and genocide. I'm Lindsay Jones. I work in Nash County um, at Nash Central High School. I'm the media specialist and I also teach journalism. Um, I've been teaching for 16 years and um, just this year joined the North Carolina Council on the Holocaust and, and the county coordinator for my county, as well as on the program planning committee. I'm Kinsey King. I teach at South Aredo High School in Statesville. I'm a museum teaching fellow. And this year I am a mentee helping with the programming committee for the council. So welcome everyone. Thank you. And we will have our presenters um, introduce themselves um, before their presentation. So just a little bit of housekeeping. This will be recorded and posted on the Holocaust Council website. So feel free to share it with your colleagues. If you want to watch it again, you're more than welcome to do so. I sent an agenda to all of you today um, that had a PDF in it that also has links to all of the resources as well as the evaluation. Um, feedback that we will use and that you will need to complete in order to get your CEU, if that's something that you need. Um, so Lauren Granite from Centropa is going to be our first presenter. Um, she has said that she is fine with questions in the middle of her presentation. So if you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat and I will facilitate that um, for you. But with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lauren. Thanks, Lauren and Lee and Lindsay and Kinsey. This is uh, really a treat to be with the North Carolina Council on the Holocaust again. We've been working. Lee Holder was our Central of his very first public school teacher. Yay! 2010, 2011. So um, I have about 20, maybe a few more minutes than that to share with you something about Centropa, but I've in particular put together this year resources about women's experiences in the Holocaust. So my plan tonight um, for my 20, 25 minutes, whatever it ends up being, is a quick introduction to Centropa so you kind of have a sense of where we're coming from and what I'm talking about when I talk about our resources. Um, I'm going to uh, show you the resources I've gathered. I've created a Google Classroom and that, that link should have been in the uh, email that Lauren sent out. And um, you will need a Gmail account to access it. And sometimes if your school is a Gmail account, it doesn't work. You'll need like a personal Gmail account. That's been our experience. Um, I'm gonna kind of show you around a little bit in that I don't have time to do any of the activities with you. And then I'd like to show you one of our films, our short multimedia films, because they're really the heart of what we do and teachers use that resource most. You can't fully understand what we do without um, seeing one of our films. And then I'll just tell you about a couple upcoming events, although you do have a link to a Google Doc that has a list and links to sign up for, um, for some of our upcoming events, um, all of which cost nothing. So, what is central, but I'm going to start by, I'm gonna share my screen. So give me one second um, and let's see. I hope this works. You should be able to see um, our website here. Um, can someone let me know if that's, you can see it? You're good. Okay. Um, Lee, I can see you in this little, uh, in your thing. So if you want to just give a hands up if I ask a, a thumbs up if I ask a question or down, that would be great. This is our website. Normally I would take you through it, but I'm, I'm not going to spend that much time on it. So Central, but it's kind of an odd name. It's a combination of Central Europe and Mittel Europa, which is the German term for Central Europe. Um, Centropa is a historical institute based in Vienna, Austria, and it was founded by our current director, Edward Serrata. And um, 
basically, uh, Ed's a nice Jewish boy from Savannah, Georgia, but he was really fascinated with Jewish life uh, in Central and Eastern Europe uh, in the 80s and 90s, you know, what happened to those communities. And he, he sold his business and he decided to become a photojournalist and that he did. And um, as he traveled around the, the elderly people he met in these small towns in Romania or Bulgaria or Hungary would take them to their apartments and show them old family albums of life before the war, you know, opera singing, aunts and chess playing, uncles or grandfathers and, you know, stories of sibling rivalry, et cetera. And he'd go back to meet them and they were all dying. And, um, because they were elderly. This was, you know, in the 80s and 90s. And um, he came across a couple of young um, history grad students in, in Hungary, Jewish students, and they were in their 20s and they were starting to have babies and everything. And they said, you know, our grandparents did uh, the, like, the Shoah Foundation. They gave their testimonies of their Holocaust experiences, but that's not the only thing we want our kids to know about them. And he thought a minute and he said, well, do they have photos? And he said, and they said, yeah, we have photographs from their life. And he said, do they have stories? And they said, well, boy, do we have stories. And so he basically um, trained people, local people, graduate students, teachers, journalists um, in 15 Central and Eastern European countries. He created a protocol uh, with, with these two young women, Esther and Dory, um, uh, where they, where they had specific ways of interviewing a whole sort of oral history project. They researched it. They had a professor working with them. They had training seminars. And basically they interviewed 1,200 elderly uh, Jews from 2000 and 2009 in 15 Central and European countries. And what makes our archive different from some of the other archives you may have encountered are we did not focus on the Holocaust and we did not use video. We said, tell us your entire life story as you show us your old family photograph. And we digitized 25,000 family photographs. So we have a digital record of Jewish life from the end of the Austro-Hungarian empire through the first decade of the 21st century. Uh, no one really has this kind of record, not even the Holocaust Museum, uh, actually, because so many people who have interviewed survivors, they, inter they didn't interview survivors who stayed in Central Europe or returned to Central Europe after leaving to survive, uh, after leaving during the war. So um, we have quite a unique record and we have it in such a unique way. So we have basically several different philosophies, and one of them is you can't just teach how Jews were murdered, you have to teach how they lived as well. And it's very important to teach a whole lifespan, to talk about, to talk about Jews in the Holocaust as, as whole people with entire lives. And we offer you the materials to do that, they're free of charge, and you can do them quickly in short, in the short amount of time I know most of you have to teach about the Holocaust. So this is our website, and um, you can search uh, you can search um, our database for the interviews or the photos. We have over 700 interviews are translated into English, and you can search by country here. So actually, I'm going to do this one. Sorry. Um, and, and we're getting it. We're, we're working very hard on a new website. It's taking longer than we wanted. So it won't exactly look like this. But so you have all of these photos. I just searched the photo database, and you have one that we have 1,228 photographs from our interviews in Poland, because I just entered Poland into that advanced search. And each one of these interviews, uh, each one of these thumbnails, you can see you, this will take you to this picture and this will take you to the interview itself. And this picture is a, a picture of a husband of one of our interviewees. So you have all the interview information here and all the photos here. And under each photograph, you have a, a description of the photograph. Uh, sometimes it's an excerpt from the interview, mostly it's a description of the photograph. And then if you go to the interviews, you can see they're actually quite long because we went back many, many times uh, over the course of several weeks, which is an advantage of not doing using video to interview them. So this is not, you wouldn't use a whole uh, interview probably in a middle school class, but maybe for a high school, maybe an honors class you would. And we also have glossaries at the end. So some of the events that they might not be familiar with are terms like Kashmir is the um, Jewish neighborhood in Krakow. Um, and then you can have, if you wanted to divide up the interview, you could go have direct links to go to different parts of the interview that way. So this is all available for you to research. Um, I'm. 
I want to quickly move on and show you one more thing before I show you the women's uh, resources we have. Um, we started making short multimedia films, and this is, like I said, kind of the heart of Centropa. And um, we have two kinds. One is our documentaries. These are short films that focus on a, sort of a series of events or a particular historical event. And we have personal story films, one of which I will show you today. And you can search, as you can see, by country for these films. Don't forget to look here if you're looking for a few more films. Uh, we did our most of our interviews were in Austria, in Vienna, and Hungary, actually, in Budapest. So we have quite a few films from there. Um, I won't go into too much about it, but every single one of these films is downloadable. We're going to end up watching this one today, the Rosa Rosenstein film. For, it's a woman who we interviewed in uh, Germany. Well, I don't know if we actually, I don't think we interviewed her in Germany, but she's from Germany. Um, and it's a seven minute film. Our shortest film is three minutes. Our longest film is 30 minutes. And every single film, no matter how short, starts at the beginning of the person's life, sometimes their parents' lives, their grandparents' lives, and goes to the end. Obviously, it doesn't include every detail, but it spans the whole life. So we offer whole pictures of, of the survivors and their families we interviewed. Um, and you can download them. But I really want you to know that everything we have here is downloadable and free. Um, and so you could download it here. So what I do want to take you to now, however, is um, this, oops, yes, here it is, is this uh, talking about uh, women's experiences in the Holocaust. I did not, you know, I'm assuming you, you've, you've done some reading about um, women in uh, the Holocaust, really complicated subject, really horrific in many ways, if you really read some of the um, experiences of women in the camps, especially. But um, what I'm going to offer you here are stories and resources that you can use. So, in order for these webinars we did in the in the fall, we created this Google Classroom called Teaching Holocaust Histories. So, and I don't know if you've used Google Classrooms before, but basically, anytime I add something new or if I post a a, um, a, a a message here, you would get it if you join if you join the classroom. Um, and the way I've divided it up is some background information. So for example, these are a couple of our um, uh, documentary films. Um, this one is a seven minute film talking about the changing borders between cent in Central and Eastern Europe from the partitions of Poland in the late 18th century through the dissolution of Yugoslavia, for example. So these are background context information, um, uh, resources that you might use. I've then divided it up. I don't know if you're familiar with Google Classrooms, but these topics are, these are the lessons and materials, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and then I divided the experiences into uh, these, Kristallnacht and or Kinder Transport, In Hiding, Help by Strangers, concentration labor or death camp experiences, women who are partisans, we have several, quite a few of those, um, and internment and detention experiences. It's a little bit of a catch all this last group, but everything revolves around this photo montage that I put together of 18 women from our interviews. I deliberately chose women of different ages, um, at that time, and definitely different countries, and as wide a range of experiences as, as, as I could manage. And as you can see, this goes on to two pages. So you have this photo montage, and what I'm going to spend a few minutes now doing is just quickly showing you what other resources are here. This is kind of the core of the different activities and lessons I've put together. Each one of these is hyperlinked. So when you click to this, it's going to take you to this picture from Dagmar Lieblova from um, Czechoslovakia at the time. Um, and this is exactly what you just saw, right? And it'll take you to the photo and the description underneath. So everything that we, all the different activities are going to revolve around students being able to do work on the, work with this photo montage in small groups, basically is, is most of, of what I have here for you to use. So using that photo montage, for example, oh, so I guess the other thing I just want to say is those 18 women, um, their, all of their stories and the direct links for their resources about their stories are under these topics. So Kitty Sushni and Lily Tauber 
um, were both on the kinder transport. And Kitty Sushni has something in her interview about living through Kristallnacht as well in Vienna. But there, what I wanted to do is to make everything user friendly. So this will take you directly to Kitty's family photographs. This will take you directly to a short piece we have on a special website. I think that's the website about the Kristallnacht. Her, her experience at Kristallnacht. So you don't have to look through her whole interview if you want that experience. It's just right there on our website about Kristallnacht. Um, this is the film we have uh, about her story, her and her husband's story actually. And this will take you to the full interview. So all of, you see her name multiple times, but these take you directly to different resources. And, and it's all like that. So that's who these 15, 18 women are. All of their resources are there. So, um, what I've done with this photo montage, the easiest way to show it to you is to show you, so for example, I've created a student worksheet. So assuming you do a kind of a jigsaw with this, like you show them all of the photos, you may maybe project it onto the, onto a screen or, oh, sorry, it's not a screen anymore. What's it? Yeah, screen in the classroom. It's still called a screen, right? Uh, and uh, you might want to talk about what are they seeing in those photos? You know, you see a woman with a gun, you see a, a young girl playing a violin, you see all these different things happening. So just talk about these, these, these young women and girls were going, were just living their lives, right? The Jews, again, it's very important for us to sort of normalize Jews. Jews are just like anyone else living their life. And then this, this particular worksheet would be this way, but you certainly can adapt it to what you want. One of the things I've been working on lately with a lot of teachers is creating activities that not only teach about the Holocaust and Holocaust stories, but teach critical thinking methods, getting students to develop curiosity, to develop really good questions. Um, and so this would have students say working in small groups um, and each student would choose one of those photos and click on it. And they would have this worksheet. And the first thing they're supposed to do is not read the text, but just look at the photo, really take time to look at that photo and come up with three questions they have about the photograph or the people in the photograph they're looking at. Then they read the text and they put the survivor's name here and the city and country she's from here. Then as they go around and describe what they've each learned, their responsibility here would be to write down what the person before them says. So if I'm reporting out, then the next person in the group has to write down in step three, my survivor's name and three words or descriptions about my, what I'm saying about my survivor. This develops really deep thinking and not thinking, listening skills. This develops responsibility, both the responsibility for me to be clear so that my, my uh, peer over here, my fellow student can um, get the information he or she needs. And it's also develops responsibility on the person listening to really represent what the first person says. Then everyone discusses these analysis questions and then everyone goes back to the original photograph. And because now that they've heard all these other stories, they go back to the original photograph and what new questions do they have about the person they looked up? Because they only learned a little bit in that blurb, right? They didn't learn the whole story. So that's an example of one thing you could do. And what are the, one of the things I've developed here is um, a teacher packet so that you have access, every single one of these hyperlinks take you to, to the film for each of these women. Um, and then each page is the photo and the, the description of the photo that you would find online so that you don't have to go online and look it all up, right? They're all just right here for you so that you know what your students are reading about. I have a version that's just has QR codes in case your students want to um, are using phones or tablets. And then I have a list of activity uh, and lesson ideas here that start with this one that I just said. And this is a little bit about just a teeny piece from the Holocaust Museum about women um, in the Holocaust not enough any, by any stretch. And then other possible activities and um, follow-up projects that you could do um, with that photo montage and just in general with these women. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is I included here, we, I developed these last year for our summer online summer academy. Uh, it, we call them Centropa moments. They're really ways to take photographs, or in this case, it's this photograph. This is the same woman you saw before, Teofila Silberain, and really teach critical uh, observation skills of looking at a photograph, creating, again, working on critical thinking, but they're like 10-minute activities. 
Um, this film activity uh, offers you an opportunity to delve into one story and create a whole research project around one woman's story. Um, I won't go into it now because of time. Okay, any questions? I, I know I'm going fast. I also know I talk quickly, but are there any questions, Lauren? Nothing in the chat so far. Okay, so what I'd like to do is I'm actually going to uh, stop sharing and share again. I know that's not like the cool way to do it. There's probably a very cool way to do it, but I don't know what that is. Um, and what I'd like to do is show you our film about Rosa Rosenstein um, to really give you a sense of how we use the photographs we digitize to tell stories. Also, as you're watching, Lee and Lauren, especially since you've been with us, and Andrea, I see you there too. Um, if you have anything else you want to, you, you can add to this, or maybe put in the chat that might help people understand what Centopa can offer them. That, that would be, I'd really appreciate that. We probably don't have time for a conversation, but maybe you can just put in the chat for them. Um, so this is the story of Rosa Rosenstein. All of our, most of our personal story films, with the exception of the one about Shelley Wiener, who is from Greensboro, North Carolina, um, originally from Poland. Um, uh, they're narrated in the original language with subtitles. So this is going to be narrated in German with subtitles. And I'm going to suggest Think about one of the things teachers we learn from teachers is you can use our resources to bring Holocaust in lots of so lots of different situations and classes that might not have to do specifically with teaching about the Holocaust. So, for example, teaching themes in social studies, themes of immigration, themes of loss, themes of survival, overcoming hardship, themes of immigration and uh, uh, displacement, th things like that. So one thing to keep in mind as you watch, I always like to give someone, uh, teachers something to do while they're watching, is um, think about what themes you might that pop up for you here. Okay, so I'm going to now play this and I hope you enjoy it. Ich wurde 1907 in Berlin geboren. Wir waren eine große Familie. Ich hatte vier Geschwister, Betty, Erna, Zilli und Arthur. Und wir blieben alle unser Leben lang sehr eng miteinander verbunden. Hier sind wir in Bad Buko. Wir sind oft Tretboot gefahren und gerudert. Im Sommer war Bad Buko Jahr für Jahr der Lieblingsplatz der ganzen Familie. Inmitten einer Gruppe jüdischer Freunde sind meine Schwester Betty, mein Verlobter Maximilian Weiß und ich. Michi, so haben wir Maximilian genannt, war von Beruf Schneider und kam aus Ungarn. Kennengelernt haben wir uns so. Ich habe in einem Fabriksgebäude mit großen Fenstern gearbeitet. Und gegenüber war eine Herrenkonfektion. Da saß an der Nähmaschine immer ein gut aussehender junger Mann. Wir haben ständig hin und her gelächelt. Eines Tages kam dann ein Bote mit einer großen Kiste bis oben gefüllt mit Konfekt und sagte, der junge Mann von drüben schickt Ihnen das. So fing alles an. Ja, und dann haben wir 1929 in Berlin geheiratet. Ende der 20er Jahre war Berlin eine Stadt mit Stil. Und hier sind wir auf einer Purimfeier und wie man sieht, waren meine Freunde und ich, wie man heute sagen würde, voll im Trend. Genau in dieser Zeit gründeten Michi und ich unsere Familie. Bessie wurde 1929 geboren und Lilly 1933. Beide gingen in einen jüdischen Kindergarten und danach in die jüdische Volksschule. Die Direktorin war schon meine Lehrerin gewesen. Ich brachte in der Früh Bessie und Lilly in den Kindergarten und arbeitete dann zusammen mit meinem Mann in unserer gemeinsamen Schneiderei. Meine Eltern wohnten nur zehn Minuten von uns entfernt. Zu dieser Zeit war alles wunderbar. 
Doch die Zeiten änderten sich. Deutschland wurde für uns Juden sehr gefährlich. Und so flüchteten wir im September 1939 nach Budapest. Mein Mann hat gesagt, bei uns in Ungarn kann uns nichts passieren. Das war drei Wochen nach Kriegsbeginn. Meine Familie war bereits nach Palästina geflüchtet und mein Schwager schrieb, schick die Kinder, schick bitte die Kinder. Wir werden sie so erziehen, als wenn es unsere eigenen wären. Und das haben wir dann auch gemacht. Mein Mann und ich wurden in Budapest verhaftet und interniert. Michi starb 1943 in einem Arbeitslager in der Ukraine. Ich überlebte den Krieg in Budapest. Zwei Jahre nachdem ich Michi verloren hatte, heiratete ich Alfred Rosenstein. Zusammen hatten wir einen Sohn, Georg. Georg wurde 1945 geboren und zwei Jahre später sind wir nach Wien in die Heimatstadt meines Mannes gezogen. Sobald es mir möglich war, reiste ich gemeinsam mit Georg zu meinen Töchtern Bessie und Lili nach Israel. Hier bin ich mit Georg und seinen Cousinen in Tel Aviv. Meine Mutter, Bessie und Lili wollten in Israel bleiben. Georg wuchs in Wien auf. Nach der Matura studierte er in Israel Psychologie und nahm den Namen Zwiba David an. Er heiratete und bekam zwei Töchter und einen Sohn. Somit lebte meine ganze Familie in Israel. Ich besuchte sie regelmäßig. Hier bin ich mit meinen Enkeltöchtern, richtigen Sabras. Von Berlin nach Budapest, von Tel Aviv nach Wien. Rosa Rosenstein hat Geschichte nicht nur erlebt, sondern gelebt. Von der Kaiserzeit bis zur Weimarer Republik. Vom Aufstieg der Nazis bis zum Überleben im belagerten Budapest. Ein neues Leben beginnend neben dem Erwachsenwerden ihrer Töchter in Israel. Anlässlich ihres 90. Geburtstags. Rosa Rosensteins Familie kam aus der ganzen Welt angereist, um sie zu feiern. Und man feierte sie jährlich bis zum Jahr 2005, indem sie im Alter von 98 Jahren verstarb. So I'm going to end there just because um, I want to hand over, uh, give Kathleen the, the, the right amount, the amount of time, you know, enough time to present. I just, I do want to say this, the thing about teaching women in the Holocaust as if you're, and it's the same if you were teaching minorities or any substrata of society is it offers you an opportunity, any, how do I say this? Women's status in society is what determined in many ways their experiences, right? And so these personal stories are what elucidate that in detail, right? This woman was a mother, she sent her kids away, right? And so a lot, uh, you know, it was true of the father too, he also sent his kids away, right? But the, one of the powerful pieces about focusing on something like women in the Holocaust or a very a sliver of, of, of um, um, of a group's experience is um, offering students an opportunity to analyze what it means to have a particular place in society and, and the impact that has when historical events take over. I have more, I have an upcoming webinar next week, which I hope you sign up for that'll go more in depth on our resources for the Holocaust and also women in the Holocaust, but I definitely want to stop now so that Kathleen has enough time. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, Lauren is going to go over um, some upcoming opportunities um, after Kathleen's presentation. Um, so we may go a few minutes over, but again, this is being recorded, so you can always access it, and then you all know how to find Centropa online. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathleen. 
Thanks so much. Hi, friends. I want to say thank you to um, Lauren for all of those resources. My goodness, I'm looking forward to uh, sharing them with my students and looking for ways to incorporate them into my classrooms. And thank you to Lauren and Lee and Kinsey and Lindsay for inviting us here tonight to share some information with from Echoes and Reflections. Um, so I am Kathleen Cadigan. I teach at Thomas Jefferson High School in Dallas, Texas. I do have a North Carolina connection. I have to shout out Hope Mills, um, North Carolina. That was where I taught my very first year. So when I talk with my students, I put on um, a really um, thick accent, which I can do because I'm from Dallas, Texas, also born and raised. And so it gets them going. So thank you very much, North Carolina, for giving me a foundation. Um, so I want to share with you some resources. I know it's been a long day, so thank you for sticking it out. Um, from, I want to share with you some resources from Echoes and Reflections. And Echoes was created in partnership with the ADL, Yad Vashem, and... Um, I'm going to try to flip all of the things at the same time. It's been a minute since I've been on Zoom. My students are mostly in person now. Um, and the USC Shoah Foundation. So I want to try to uh, respect our time. So I will zip through it as much as we can. We have lots of goals when we're teaching about the Holocaust. But one of, our, one of my goals here tonight is to help you to build your confidence and capacity when you're teaching this subject. So we are gonna zip right through. Um, one of the things that I've found with Echoes and Reflections in the curriculum that we offer is our ability to define terms, examine anti-Semitism, really provide historical context while we're using these primary resources and teaching the human story. So I'm gonna share with you some of those resources so that you'll be able to do some of those things in your classroom tomorrow, if that's what you need to do. Um, and in some of those ways that Lauren was talking about earlier, encouraging critical thinking, making the Holocaust relevant. And one of the things that I think um, I'm struggling to do with my students after their experience the last couple of years, which is foster empathy. And um, I think that These lessons, I think, particularly when, you know, we're doing what Lord, Lauren was talking about by looking at a small group and their um, place in society, I think maybe this helps our students to do that. So um, I'm going to jump right in so we can listen to some of those voices. So um, I could, I, I do want to pop out and share with you the website. Um, it is echoesandreflections.org, and you have that website on the PDF that was sent to you earlier. I'm going to just pop through and show you a couple of features on the very first page at the bottom. Uh, there are educator resources. The lesson plans is the area that I use most often as an educator. I teach uh, a college course, AP US history, and I teach uh, research methods, Holocaust studies, which is a year long course as well. So I have lots of preps, talk really fast and I move really quickly um, to try and keep it all, all the, the juggling in play. Um, but this is the area that I use the most, which is lesson plans. And I'll show you that specifically, but I wanted to um, point out a couple of other areas that will be helpful to teachers as well. This timeline area is really helpful for students. It takes a while to load, so I won't show you here tonight. Um, it has lots of resources all in one place, uh, divided by year. There's videos, there's artifacts, there's um, biographical information. This area frequently asked questions by students. There's articles that really help me for background information as an educator. And there's an audio glossary and video toolbox. I also wanted to point out other programming um, for those of you who are looking to fill your own toolbox. There are lots of programs for educators through Echoes and Reflections. 
to jump right to teach, I just want to point out a few things before we go and listen to um, some testimony and those voices that I think are so helpful in our teaching. I'm just going to pull up one of the lesson plans. There are 11 different lessons and they're all organized in the same way. There's a quote at the top. There's information for preparing to teach the unit essential questions. On the right-hand side, there's keywords. All of these lessons are um, organized according to the Common Core Standards. There's the video testimony guide and asset resource guide that gets you to all of the artifacts. Along the right-hand side, you'll see all of the handouts linked. For those of you who are very lucky and you don't have to turn in lesson plans, congratulations. I've been teaching for 26 years and I still have to turn them in. It ruins my life, but um, I have to turn in things that include like learning objectives and whatnot. So thank you administrators who are on the call, you're ruining our lives. Um, so these are objectives that would be listed here. On the right-hand side, you'll also find um, the testimony. What I wanted to point out to you is the um, lesson plan is broken down into, or the unit plan is broken down into a couple of parts. So you'll find um, the timing of it. And um, then you can kind of pick and choose what works for you, what works for your classroom. But I wanted to point this out to you. So if you're, for example, going to use Roman Kent's testimony in your class, you can click on this. It'll take you over to YouTube. You can use the CC closed caption function. But you can also do some background reading or have your students do some background reading. Um, they're always going to ask you, you know, questions. Where is that person from? What happened to them in the end? And you'll be able to find all of that information in this biographical profile. The website also includes um, discussion questions and you can use those in small groups or whole groups. And then there are all kinds of graphic organizers which are super helpful um, in the classroom. They're um, often PDF'd off to the side so you can print them and use them for your class or put them into Google Classroom if you are hybrid as well. I'll let you go through the rest of that uh, yourself, but I wanted to point out some of those highlights for you and your students um, so that you would have those uh, elements for you and your students in your classroom. So let's jump right to it. For women in the Holocaust, I pulled out four different pieces of testimony. Um, for example, this is Itka, and she is going to share with us resistance through spirit. And um, her particular piece of testimony is in um, lesson five, and it's part of a larger lesson that students would brainstorm and have a discussion about dehumanization. When my students had that conversation, it was really fascinating. They had a great list that they put together and then they came up with a definition for dehumanization. There's also excerpts from um, an interview with Franz Stengel and an excerpt from Survival in Auschwitz. So if you're looking for some of those primary resources and perhaps you're in a financially challenged school like my students might find themselves in, and you can't afford to buy all those texts, there are resources there that you'll be able to access. There's an earlier clip with ITCA, and then there is this clip, which I've quoted part of it here below. But here we go, let's listen to her speak. And let's hope I clicked all the buttons. So somebody give me a thumbs up that you can hear her, please, and thank you. Physically, I was totally enslaved. I had no control of life, spiritually. I could think and feel what I wanted. And I remember one time when I was in Auschwitz and I felt the burden, the bitter taste of slavery. 
and I felt oh, if I would have a pencil and paper now I would write a poem, but there was no pen pencil and paper. I told you my earthly possessions was what I wore and the bowl, the enamel bowl from which we got the soup. So I wrote a poem in my, in my head and when I was liberated, when I came here to America, of course I couldn't speak a word of English. It was constant adjusting from one to the other. So that was among my first poems, and I would like to share it. I feel like a bird with clipped wings, tied to this earth by invisible strings, chained to a destiny I did not choose. I feel like a prisoner that cannot break loose. I look at the sky with a heavy sigh, but my wings have been clipped, and I can no longer fly. And then I realize that the concept of freedom is a bird in flight and not in a bird in a cage. And I pledge to myself, if I'll get out, I will never use brute force. I will never try to force somebody to do something, but neither will I allow other people to do it. I understood the concept of freedom. I understood what my forefathers, what they the Jews in Egypt, the Israelites in Egypt must have felt like. And I realized that there is no substitute for personal experience, from knowledge derived from personal experience. I realized then that nothing in the world, no textbook, no professor, not the best college could teach me what my experience taught me because I had to, I got to know myself who I am, how much I could endure, how much I could understand, how much I could feel, and how, what that became. So um, after listening to this testimony, I might ask my students a question like, how did um, poetry sustain Itka? How did, um, what did writing this poem, or how did this poetry, um, what did it help her to discover? Um, and you would be surprised the conversations your students would have. Also, I'll note um, this particular piece of testimony always reminds me of Miklos Radnati. Um, Lauren, I know you did some work in, or your organization does work with a Hungarian um, population. And he was a, also a poet who wrote as he walked in a death march and then um, wrote it down in the evenings. So it always reminds me of him. So this is Renee Scott and she's going to share with us resistance through action. And this is part of a larger lesson on the righteous of the nations. It includes an eyewitness activity from the USC Shoah Foundation the students would read an article about rescue in Denmark and have a discussion about that. But let's, let's listen to Renee's video. That's how we, we saved the, the Jewish people, by making false IDs. That was at the office, at the Chamber of Commerce. And then the papers, we made out papers and we sent them in certain places in the south of France, most of them. They knew that the Chamber of Commerce, how they knew it, I don't know. There are all kinds of underground things that gave them the, the, the where, where they had to go. So they had the excuse that they wanted to find work or they wanted this, and they'd come to us. And when they came to us, we, they had a certain, how do I say, certain ID on them or a certain sign on them that we knew what they wanted. Sometimes we did. 25 a day, not every day, but I would say at least maybe 200, 300 a week. These poor people are trying to get away, get away, you know. I am happy for what I did do to help people, and I will always try to help people. I'm very happy that I was able to help so many Jewish people. And so the discussion questions that would go along with Renee Scott's testimony would include the process 
for these IDs and how she was able to help people, perhaps the number. Um, but I think the process is what is significant we, for sorry, um, this particular piece of testimony. That's how we, just all over that's the place how we, now. We saved the, okay. the Jewish people. There we go. Um, and then perhaps a name and a face that your students will um, find familiar is Meet Geis. And there is a article on the Echoes and Reflections website that we would have, I would have my students read. And this article um, is three pages, mas o menos. And this is the speech that Meet Geis gave uh, for her Lifetime Achievement Award from the Anti-Defamation League in 1996. And in this particular speech, um, you could have your students um, do it as a jigsaw, just to give you a couple of different ways to um, strategies to use this particular article. You could have your students jigsaw it, look for the choices that individuals, communities, or groups, or even nations make that you see reflected in the article. Um, look for the setting and summary of the reading. Um, one is to pay attention to the choices that people are making. And I think that um, that is one that I often will highlight is the idea of choices. And then a quote or a passage that sticks out. And one that often does with my students is this particular quote that I will share with you. Um, and this is towards the end of the article. She says, people sometimes call me a hero. I don't like it because people should never think that you have to be a very special person to help those who need you. I myself am just a very common person. I simply had no choice. And she says this in her speech right after she calls um, the people that she was helping heroes. Um, I think this allows an opportunity for us to speak with our students about the idea of a hero and the place of heroes in our society, particularly women who are heroes, right? Um, and so I think it's it, a great opportunity for us to foster that conversation with our students. So that we can stay on track with time, I wanna leave you with one more uh, message. And this is this universal message from Annalise Nussbaum, very briefly. And it's gone. Okay, let's try that again. We have anti-Semitism right now. You want to know about it? When we, when we heard about the St. Louis, and especially here, Philadelphia, Philadelphia, I called a friend of mine in New York who's also a survivor, and I said, Anna, would you believe after 70, 80 years, you and I, are still talking about this? We're being violated again? The message that we have about the Holocaust is a universal message now. For all the things that, going, that are going on in the world, it, the Holocaust was a blueprint on so many things that are going on today. That's horrible. That's horrible, and they should know the origin. So I actually shared that um, particular clip with my students very recently. We had an incident here in Dallas. Um, and I think it's important that our students 
see those connections very clearly from the survivors themselves. So uh, I hope that uh, if you have any questions that you have the opportunity to share those questions, you're welcome to, oops, I did, didn't put my name on there. I have put someone else's name on there. Sorry, I'm Kathleen Cadigan, not Jen Goss. Um, but please feel free to go onto the Echoes and Reflections website. There's lots of different professional development programs. Um, and please reach out if you have any questions. I am happy to do what I can to answer um, and share with you any resources that I'm using in my classroom as well. So I wish you well with the rest of your school year. Um, we can make it, I will say that. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, Lauren, do you wanna quickly go over some of the Centropa upcoming events? Thank you. Just for, I'll just do very quickly. One thing Centropa offers is an international network of teachers. And this Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern time, we have Cafe Centropa Teachers Edition. We started this during the pandemic and it's 90 minutes. You log on. I'm actually going to be saying a little something about the Teaching Women's History Google Classroom in case anyone's interested for Women's History Month. But then you'll have two 30 minute sessions in small breakout rooms with teachers from Ukraine, Hungary, whoever signed up. Um, and you just schmooze and talk about whatever you want. That's a way to connect during a pandemic. And um, it's a nice way to learn about what teachers are going through. And you literally can talk about whatever you want. There's no agenda. Um, we also have, like I said, next week, I think it's on March. Uh, I'm gonna put it in the, um, excuse me, I'm gonna put a, a Google doc in the, um, uh, chat, but um, next week, I think it's March 3rd, we'll do a 90 minute teaching women's histories. And then in this Google Doc here, you'll see we have a bunch of upcoming webinars that teach about Sephardic Jews, Jews originally from Spain, who the majority of Sephardic Jews in the former Yugoslavia and Greece were, were murdered. And these are just stories that are not often told. So we'll be doing a couple webinars in March on that, and you can join any one of them. And then finally, well, there are two more things. And finally, the other thing I'll say is we have a civics competition. You know, it's really important to take uh, take what students are learning, lessons from the Holocaust and put into action. And we have a civics competition called the Milton Wolf Prize and students identify a community problem, research how it's being addressed by local organizations, create a presentation, a video, a PowerPoint, whatever website, and then they have to present it to some local or local group of people outside their classroom and they send it into us and we're offering cash prizes. And that's due August 29th. So I'm happy to talk to anyone about any of this. You have my email address in the email that um, Lauren sent out. And um, we can also talk about our um, summer trip to Berlin. We have a seven day trip to Berlin this summer and we'd love to bring North Carolina teachers. That's as fast as I could do it, Lauren. I hope that was fast. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> um, and I'm going to drop, even though I've emailed it all to you and I'm going to email it again, dropping the link in the chat um, that has the document with all of these resources. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lee Holder, who's going to talk about some of the resources from the council, as well as give a little information about some women survivors in North Carolina. Lee, mm -hmm. would you like me to pull up the um, PowerPoint. A little mini PowerPoint first, the four slide deal. Yep, I can do that. And then we'll do the resource list real quick. That won't take long. All right, there we go. Okay, just very quickly, I would be very remiss if we talked about women in the Holocaust and didn't mention Gisela Abramson. I apologize for the placement of the photos here. I need to move that one over in the middle. Uh, many of you know Gisela's story, but she was a young uh, teen when the war broke out. She was living in Poland. Uh, she escaped, and I know I always pronounce this wrong, it's Luck Ghetto, L-U-C-K. She joined the Partisans. Uh, she ended up being captured, sent to the Maidanic death camp, uh, survived there as a forced laborer and translator. Uh, she survived the death march afterwards. 
Uh, after the war, I think in 1946, she moved to the United States. 1970, she moved to North Carolina. And starting in 1973, and then for over 30 years, she, uh, and, and this is the Gisela I know on the next slide, for over 30 years, she spoke continually to schools, uh, civic organizations, uh, anyone, churches, synagogues, uh, the military, anyone uh, that would invite her, she spoke uh, uh, to them about her experience so that we could learn from that. Uh, she is a founding member of the North Carolina Council on the Holocaust, and we were the first state council in the nation, so she was part of that. And recently, last year, uh, North Carolina passed the Gisela Abramson Holocaust Education Act, mandating Holocaust education in North Carolina, and that's something we're working on very hard uh, to put into place over the next two years. So I wanted to mention her, and then the next slide. Most importantly, I wanted to mention her. Uh, very quickly, this is someone you may not be familiar with. This is the oldest photograph I could find of Tarboro, North Carolina, uh, which is in Edgecombe County in the eastern part of the state. In 1878, uh, David and Sarah Sternglantz moved to Tarboro from Germany. They opened a store here uh, in 1881. A few years later, they had a daughter named Therese. Uh, and then she was raised in North Carolina. They lived here for a little over 10 years. Then the economic uh, reception, uh, depression hit and they were forced to move back to Germany. Uh, and if you'll go to the next slide, and this young North Carolinian, this young girl, Therese, uh, from North Carolina, uh, grew up in Germany. She married, uh, had two children. It was an unhappy marriage. Uh, so she got a divorce. Her youngest uh, son uh, died in infancy. Her daughter grew up and her daughter actually left Germany in 1933 with her son-in-law and they went to England. I have no idea why Therese did not go with them or if she tried to leave Germany. But sadly, in 1941, Therese was deported from Munich to a destination in the east. All of the Holocaust data, databases don't know where she ended up, but this young North Carolina girl, this girl that grew up in North Carolina, uh, ended up being murdered in the Holocaust. Uh, she grew up in North Carolina and was murdered in the Holocaust. I don't know if she is the only person uh, from North Carolina that had that fate, but I did want to mention her uh, since she is so little known uh, and I wanted to mention her to teachers. And uh, Lauren, if you don't mind going to the, the resources real quick and I could share those in one minute. Yep. Is that possible? Yep. Of course, my internet decides to be slow. Sorry, guys. Oh, no problem. There we go. That's because this is a resource list that Lauren sent you. Um, doing research over the last week, I was able to find 30 survivors of the 30 female survivors from North Carolina or that moved to North Carolina that had survived the Holocaust. And uh, I have their uh, audio testimony here for all 30. And I'm sure there were more than this, but these are the ones that I could find. So all of those with the links are listed there uh, as you go through that. And then after that, I was able to list, uh, as you can see, there are quite a few, which, which to be honest, surprised me. These are some readings that you could assign your students. They're very student friendly. It is from the North Carolina uh, Narratives book. And I've got the link to the book. And then if you want the one specifically from females, uh, from women, they are on the next pages. And I'll link to them specifically to let you know which ones they were. All right. Thank you, Lee. Anything because, else you want to add? No, and if you go through that, there's a lot of more resources. And it's broken down by category especially if you live in the western part of the state. I think it's letter K. It's got this great 20 panel exhibit on survivors just from Western North Carolina that you could look at in the links there. There's a lot of information there. So when you look through it, if you have any questions, please contact me and I'll be glad to, 
to help you. And, and like I said earlier, we've got a the Gisela Gross Abramson Resource Center here in Kinston, and I'm here to help you with any resource needs that you have. Thanks, Lee. Thank you. thank you, Lee. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Kathleen. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, so I will be following up with an email tomorrow, most likely with the agenda and resource link once again, um, and really kind of highlighting our evaluation link. Um, for those of you that maybe are in a renewal year, um, if you fill out the evaluation link, Karen Claych will get back with you about CEUs. Um, I think she normally sends the CEUs out at the end of the year, especially for those of you that come to multiple webinars and professional development sessions so that you have all of them in one document. But if you need them earlier, um, just reach out to her and she will be more than happy um, to get that for you. Um, oh, Karen just said, nope, I'm sending them out as we progress. Okay, so yes, you'll send them out. Um, also, if you ever have any questions, need resources, feel free to reach out to any of us who are on the council and we will get um, help you as much as we can. For those of you that are in the East, please, if you get a chance to go to Kinston, visit Lee at the Holocaust Resource Center. Um, and with that, if Lee, Kenzie, Lauren, Kathleen, Lindsay, anybody have anything they want to add? Just thanks thank to you. For thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. It is 832, so only two minutes over. I hope everybody has a great rest of the week. Hang in there. Hang in there, everyone. You're doing good work. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.